Hello friends and neighbors, Regular Matt here. As you know, we have been doing Books vs. Movies reviews for quite a while now. It's by far our most popular series on this channel, and we still get a lot of requests and suggestions and recommendations for reviews that we can do. There are a lot of these movie adaptations, and there are only so many that we can do. But we do at least try to give almost every suggestion at least some due consideration. But there is a line, and some recommendations do cross that line. And so in this video, I am going to share with you 10 books versus movies reviews that we will never do. Some of these will be specific reviews, and some of them will just be kind of categories of reviews. But regardless, these are the reviews that we just don't even want to touch. Not even as reviews of shame. You just don't want to look at them at all. So those of you who are thinking of making books versus movies review recommendations, start taking notes. Number 10. Fifty Shades of Grey. Alright, to the credit of our viewers, we've never gotten this suggestion. No one has ever recommended that we do Fifty Shades of Grey books versus movies. Thank you for that, by the way, and hopefully no one will ever recommend that one, but I just want to make that very clear right here from the get-go. Don't want to read the book, don't want to see the movie, don't want to really even acknowledge that this story exists. So, this is the only mention I'm going to make of it. <laughs> Number nine. Battlefield Earth. I include this on the list only because it's really the only books versus movies review that I outright said no to from the very beginning without any sort of consideration at all. It was only recommended to me by one very, very persistent subscriber, but he did recommend it to me a number of times, so I'm gonna put it out there. I have no desire to read a book by the founder of Scientology, nor do I have a desire to watch a movie that has been dubbed one of the worst ever made. <laughs> Number eight, The Frog Prince versus The Princess and the Frog. Back when we did our Fairy Tales vs. Disney review, we got a lot of requests and questions as to why we didn't include certain stories in the review. For those of you who don't know or haven't seen the review, we focused around three specific stories, Snow White, Cinderella, and Sleeping Beauty, while also including some material from other stories, Disney movies that have been based on fairy tales over the years, specifically The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, and Rapunzel and Tangled. For this review, we picked a very specific definition of fairy tale. To me, a fairy tale is any story that was once passed down by oral tradition and was later collected by a fairy tale collector like Charles Perrault or the Grimm Brothers or someone along those lines. We also included in this definition any original story that is basically treated like a fairy tale and is kind of universally accepted as a fairy tale because it's written in the same style as a fairy tale. So that's how we're able to include Hans Christian Andersen's Little Mermaid in there. So we got people asking, Asking why we didn't include things like Peter Pan and Pinocchio and Alice in Wonderland and things that are often considered to be fairy tales for whatever reason, but they didn't fit in with our definition because they're still relatively recent original stories by somebody and not typically really treated like fairy tales in spite of the fact that both Pinocchio and Peter Pan actually have fairies in them. To us, those are bigger stories that deserve kind of their own review, and so to narrow it down in this way, we just stuck to those seven stories. This is all kind of a roundabout way of getting to the point, which is that one of the recommendations or questions that we got a lot was why we didn't include The Princess and the Frog in our list. And this might seem obvious, because The Princess and the Frog is based on The Frog Prince. That's pretty unambiguously a fairy tale by our definition, right? Well, yes, The Frog Prince is a fairy tale by our definition, but the problem is The Princess and the Frog is not based on The Frog Prince. The Princess and the Frog is actually based on a children's novel by E.D. Baker called The Frog Princess, and this book came out in 2002, which is a little bit too recent to be considered a fairy tale. Now that story is kind of a retelling, adaptation, gender-swapping version of The Frog Prince, so you can kind of get there in a roundabout way, but there are a few too many steps between The Princess and the Frog and The Frog Prince for me to consider it being based on The Frog Prince. So I will not be doing that particular Books vs. Movies review, though I will not outright say no to a Books vs. Movies review of The Frog Princess versus The Princess and the Frog. <laughs> Number seven, any adaptation of a Dr. Seuss book. I toyed with this one for a while, but after thinking about it, I realized that it was very, very unlikely that I was ever going to do a comparison like this. You're basically talking about two separate things. First, you've got the classic 
animated stories like the How the Grinch Stole Christmas that everyone watches at Christmas time and all that sort of thing. These are perfectly lovely and wonderful tellings of the stories, but they're basically just readings of the story with animation, which doesn't make for a great comparison as far as a books versus movies review goes. And the other thing we could be talking about are the live action movies that started with Jim Carrey and How the Grinch Stole Christmas and continued with The Cat in the Hat and The Lorax and Horton Hears a Who. Now, admittedly, the only one of these movies I've actually seen is How the Grinch Stole Christmas, which, because of a lot of its crude humor, earned a PG-13 rating, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense for a children's book adaptation, but whatever. But from what I've heard, the other adaptations of these Dr. Seuss books kind of fall along the same lines. You've got a really, really heavily padded movie that's very flashy and has a lot of crude humor with maybe a little bit of Dr. Seuss's original message crammed in there somewhere. Adapting children's picture books into feature films is very difficult. You almost have to include padding of some sort. You have to make the story more complicated than it is in the original book because children's picture books are, by their very nature, very simple. Too simple for a full-length feature film. Which isn't to say that it can't be done. I still think that Where the Wild Things Are is one of the very best adaptations of this particular genre. But it's very difficult and you have to put a lot of thought into it and... The Dr. Seuss adaptations just don't. And also, to me, Dr. Seuss's stories are just about as perfect as children's books can possibly be. You really don't need to mess with them. Their simplicity is what really makes them stand out. And messing with that simplicity, and especially messing with it in a way that seems to go completely against the things that Dr. Seuss was trying to get across, just really leaves a bad taste in my mouth. So. I don't want to even acknowledge the existence of these movies, and I'm not going to do a comparison of them. <laughs> Number six, James and the Giant Peach. This one might seem a strange one to include. I've done Roald Dahl in the past, I did Matilda, I did Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and this is the other Roald Dahl book that I've actually read, so it seems natural that I should do this one to round out my Roald Dahl trilogy. And it's a relatively inoffensive book and a decent adaptation of it, so what's the deal here? Well, to be honest, I have gotten this suggestion a few times and I was never really excited about it. Like, I don't remember being super, super into the book. I remember it being okay, but I didn't really enjoy it. It wasn't really memorable to me, and the same goes for the movie. And I don't want to do a full books versus movies review for two stories that I just feel kind of meh about. So I'm not going to be doing this one either. <laughs> Number five, any of the remaining Twilight stories. One was enough, guys. One was enough. <laughs> Number four, Wicked. Now, believe it or not, my objection to doing this particular story has nothing to do with the fact that I would be comparing a book to a stage musical. I have no problem with tweaking the formula a little bit if it makes for an interesting comparison. My problem with doing this one is that I would have to read Gregory Maguire's book again. For those of you who haven't read the book, it does not resemble the musical in tone at all. It's very dark and very dense and very difficult to read. Not to say that it's not good, it's a good story, but his writing style is really, really difficult to read just because of how dark it is. It's the sort of book that you want to read once just to say that you've done it and then immediately turn to something like Sideways Stories from Wayside School to remind you how to laugh again. And when I thought about reading that again and all of the tweaking I would have to do to the formula and putting that up against a comparison that, to me, isn't all that interesting anyway, it just didn't seem like an appealing prospect to me. Number three, any adaptation of a book that I've already done. I already made this mistake once with Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I did two separate reviews for the two adaptations of that book that have come out, the one in 1971 starring Gene Wilder and the one in 2005 starring Johnny Depp. And I continue to maintain that the second of these, the one where I compared it to the Johnny Depp movie, is the worst books versus movies review that I have done. And a big part of that is because I was rehashing a lot of the same points that I made in the original review because I was still comparing it to the same story, just a different adaptation. My rationale for doing two separate reviews for this particular story was that one movie was clearly better than the book and one movie was clearly not. But that's not something that I really want to go through again, and so if there are multiple adaptations of the book and they're all kind of on an equal level, I'll review them as a group like I did with A Christmas Carol. <laughs> Number two, Hamlet versus The Lion King. Okay. This is another one that I got a lot after doing the fairy tale versus Disney review. People ask me 
many of them, I think, facetiously, to their credit, to do a Books vs. Movies review of Hamlet vs. The Lion King. For those of you who aren't aware of this, if you look at the characters in Hamlet and you look at the characters in The Lion King, you find a lot of kind of parallels. Simba being parallel to Hamlet, Mufasa being parallel to King Hamlet, Scar being parallel to Claudius, Zazu being parallel to Polonius, Timon and Pumbaa being parallel to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, that sort of thing. And so for a while there was this thing on the internet that said, hey look, The Lion King is based on Hamlet. It's just Hamlet with animals and a happy ending. But if you've actually ever read or seen Hamlet, you know that that's not the case. The movie is inspired by elements of the story of Hamlet. It's also inspired by elements of the story of Macbeth and the biblical stories of Joseph and Moses. In fact, it really has more to do with the biblical stories of Joseph and Moses than it does with anything Shakespeare wrote, although I'm not going to do that comparison either, don't ask. Now, they both do have similar premises, with a prince reacting to the death of his father at the hands of his father's brother so that he might become king. But think about it for a minute. Hamlet is the story of redemption. It's the story of Hamlet avenging his father's death by pretending he's crazy so that he can ascertain Claudius's guilt and eventually kill him. Lion King, on the other hand, is a coming-of-age story about a young prince lion who, blaming himself for his father's death, runs away and lives a sort of hippie lifestyle before eventually coming back to assume his responsibilities as king. The two stories are completely different. They're not comparable at all. In fact, I pretty much just gave you everything that you can compare about them when I listed the different parallel characters. So, yeah, no. <laughs> and the number one books versus movies review that I will never do, any novelization of a movie. I think I've probably gotten this request from day one of starting this reviewing series. Will I ever do a reverse books versus movies review where I look at a books adaptation of a movie, and my response has pretty universally been no, and my reason for this is that novelizations of movies suck. And while this is certainly true, it's only partially the reason why I won't do this particular review, and it is possible for a good novelization of a movie to exist. I think that the novelization of The Where the Wild Things Are movie was actually pretty good. But there is actually a bigger reason why I won't do this particular type of review, and I'm gonna let you in on a little secret, and you, you can't tell Hatter I said this, honestly. Books versus movies reviews really is more about the movies. I primarily started doing books versus movies reviews as a response to all of the people who said and who continue to say that books are always better than the movie, that you will never find a movie that is better than the original story of the book. I do not find this to be true, and I wanted to outline why. I wanted to illustrate that movies can adapt a book well and can actually become better than the book if they do it correctly. The interesting thing about books is that they are entirely imaginary. You have to imagine everything that you are reading. And in order to adapt that into a visual format, into something that you can actually see, you have to consider the collective imaginations of anybody who has ever read this particular story. And the way that directors and writers and even actors have chosen to do that over the years is really, really fascinating to me. And for all the crap that we give to movie makers for changing the story of the book, this is not an easy thing to do because there are some things that just plain won't work in movie format. And it's interesting for me to look at the methods that movie makers have used over the years to accomplish this, both good and bad. But looking at it in the other direction isn't nearly as interesting because movie adaptations of books aren't going anywhere anytime soon, but book adaptations of movies aren't really adaptations of movies, they're just descriptions of movies, just detailed descriptions that you can read. They're basically just advertisements for the movies. When you're reading a book that is based on a movie, you're basically just imagining the movie. The movie has already given you everything that you need to imagine, it's just writing a description out for you with maybe a few tweaks and added scenes here and there to flesh it out a little bit. But it's not an interesting comparison. And to me, doing that just goes against the very spirit of the reviews, which is to illustrate that movies can do decent and even really, really good adaptations of the books that they're based on, and yes, they can even be better than books at times. So the Books vs. Movies reviewing series is going to remain a look at movie adaptations of the books and not the other way around. 
And that does it for my 10 books versus movies reviews that I will never ever do. This is by no means an exclusive list. There are other things that I just plain don't want to do, but these are the 10 most pressing, I think. So keep those recommendations coming, but I can't make any promises that I'll do any of them. See ya.